Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. Last time, we managed to get our whole triangle rasterizer in its fully improved state. We don't have massive scan buffers that we have to create and move around and manipulate. We don't have to deal with wacky fill conventions where sometimes things won't get lit up even though it's inside the triangle. All those rasterization quality issues are taken care of. So now we're going to start dealing with interpolation. Interpolating things like colors, texture coordinates, lighting, all the things that make rasterization look interesting. But to do that we're going to need to deal with interpolants, which are, well, all the variables we're interpolating over the triangle. So in this video, I'd like to go through some of the mathematics behind how we're going to be interpolating variables across the triangle. Simply because it's not that the math is hard, but it is a little bit counterintuitive in places. Kind of like with fill conventions. The fill convention was just the ceiling function, but it's a little bit counterintuitive as to why it's the ceiling function. And that's why I want to talk about the math behind the interpolants right here. So, with that, let's go ahead and let's get started. So, I'm going to start by defining the mathematical variable C as the interpolant. And this is any variable we define at the vertices of the triangle that we might be interested in interpolating across the face of the triangle. So this could be something like color. We could find a color at all the vertices, we interpolate it across to get some gradients along the triangle. Or it could be something like texture coordinates. We interpolate the texture coordinates across the triangle so that we can draw texture on it. Or it could be something like lighting. We interpolate the lighting across the triangle so we know how bright it is. Anything like that is C. And our ultimate goal are to calculate the gradients of C. So this is how much we step it in X and how much we step it in Y. So as we're going scanning across on the x-axis, we'd step across the x-step. As we're interpolating down on the y-axis, this is how much we'd move on the y-step, and so forth and so on. That's all we're trying to calculate, the x-step and y-step for the interpolant. So hopefully that's nothing too confusing so far. So let's say this is our triangle. And as we know, we're defining our triangles by their vertices. So we have P0 for the min y vertex, P1 for the mid y vertex, and P2 for the max y vertex. And every vertex has some x position, some y position, and the interpolant we're interested in. It might have more information than this, but this is all we care about for this particular problem. And like we mentioned, our ultimate goal is to calculate the gradients of the interpolant. How much does our interpolant need to step on the x and y axis? And to do this, we're going to do a bit of a mathematical trick. We're going to define two more vertices that well, we don't actually have in our triangle, P3 and P4. And the most significant thing to notice about this is P3 is aligned with P0 on the x-axis, and P4 is aligned with P0 on the y-axis. And you might be wondering, how does that matter? Why are we defining these new vertices that we don't actually have? Because of this. With P4, the y-axis is constant. So that means the only variables remaining, since y is constant, is x in and c in. So calculating the gradient on x is very easy. It's c4 minus c0 over x4 minus x0. It's just, well, this is the same thing we did to calculate the x-step for our triangle. And the same thing works for our gradient. And similarly with P3, 
the x is constant, so the only thing remaining is y3 and the interpolant. So calculate c3 minus c0 over y3 minus y0. Again, the same sort of process we did for x step on our triangle, and that gives us the gradient on y. And it's really that simple. So all we have to do now is determine the appropriate information for p4 and p3, and we will have an equation to calculate the gradients of, well, for our interpolant on x and our interpolant on y. So, how do we find the necessary information about p3 and p4 to find the gradients? And to find this, I'm just going to start by making a few observations. There's actually a few we've already made. For instance, p4 and p0 are along the exact same y-coordinate. So therefore, y0 and y4 must be equivalent. And similarly, p0 and p3 have the same x-position, so x0 and x3 are equivalent. Another observation you might make is p4, p1, p3, and p2 are all along the exact same line. So if I defined a line between, say, P1 and P2, and then defined another line between P4 and P2, both of those lines would have the exact same slope. Why? Because, really, all those points are along the exact same line. So the slope between P1 and P2 is equal to the slope between P4 and P2. There you go. But now, here is really the key observation about all of this. Right now, we've done the slope of x with respect to y in this observation. But why does it have to be the slope of x with respect to y? Slope is valid between any two linear variables. So why does it have to be just x and y? Our interpolant is a linear variable. So why can't it be the slope of c with respect to y, for instance? There's no reason stopping that. So the slope of c with respect to y will also be the same among any points on this line. Why? Because they're all, ultimately, points along the exact same line. So there. And this is really the key observation here. If that made sense to you, which I hope it did, then you can then go and solve these gradient equations. So, from the, here on out, it's just algebra. So let's go ahead and let's solve the gradient equations using these observations we've made. So, these are the slope equations that we just defined. Now, from our observations, we know that y4 is equal to y0. So we can do a substitution here. And if you notice, there's only one variable left that we don't know. That's x4 in this equation and c4 in this equation. So we can multiply both sides by y0 minus y2 and then add x2 or c2 respectively to both sides and that gets us the equation for x4 and c4. And if you think about it, these equations really do make sense. So if I go back to our illustration here, x1 minus x2 over y1 minus y2, that's just the slope of this line. And if we multiply the slope of the line by, well, y0 minus y2, which is the y of p0 and the y of p2, so this y distance, then that's effectively moving us this far on x, moving us between p2 and p4. And all we have to do from there is add x2 to, nat to account for the initial offset of p2, and what do you know? That's the x location of p4. And same sort of equation applies for c4. So hopefully that makes some 
mathematical and logical sense as to why that is. So here are the interpolants for x4 and c4 that we just derived. And this is the equation for our interpolants x step for the gradient on x that we talked about earlier. Now we know x4 and c4 now because of these equations, and we know c0 and x0 because that, that just comes from one of our vertices. So all we have to do is a substitution and some algebra, and we can find the equation for this gradient. Now this equation works, but it's slightly monstrous. So let's do a little bit of algebra to make it a little bit nicer. You can multiply both sides by y1 minus y2 over y1 minus y2, and the reason you can do this is because this cancels out and just becomes 1. So we're really multiplying by 1 here. And doing that cancels out the denominators here, the y1 minus y2 and y1 minus y2 here. So that simplifies this, and this is now multiplied by y1 minus y2, but that's okay. And this equation, I think, is a lot nicer to look at and work with. And one more thing you can do that's sort of optional, but I like to do it, is you can swap the order of c0 and c2 and x0 and x2 and change this plus to a minus. And this doesn't really change anything, but it does make everything in our equation either a multiply or a subtraction, which is kind of neat in my opinion. And there, now we have the equation for, well, our gradient on x. And for the gradient on y, you do a mostly, pretty much the exact same process, except more focused on vertex 3 rather than vertex 4. If you want to go through and derive it, it's basically the same algebraic steps, except with, well, you know, those positions instead. So I'm going to save you the hassle of going through that. If you're really that interested, you can, well, you, you can go ahead and derive it yourself. You know everything you need to to derive it now. But if you do it, you get this equation. And you might notice this equation looks awfully similar. The numerator is exactly the same, which makes sense since the numerator is still dc. And the denominator is almost the same, but the order of these two terms is swapped. So therefore, dx is equal to negative dy. And there, we have accomplished our goal for the video. We've derived equations for the gradients, and as a little bonus, we have found a nice simple way of calculating dy from dx, or vice versa. And that's really all I wanted to cover in this video. If you want more information about gradients and how they work and how they relate to more advanced rasterization techniques, I suggest looking at one of Chris Hecker's articles on perspective texture mapping, which I'll leave a link to in the video description. Because that's really the only place I found that does any decent job of talking about these. But how can we take these gradients and these interpolants and actually do the more interesting rasterization techniques? Find out next time on the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned, and I'll see you then.